the guy who was made Secretary of Treasury, uh, Secretary of the Treasury, Lincoln administration, <clears throat> Salmon P. Chase, a former Democrat, <clears throat> Cincinnati. Now, for some reason, Chase was always, always heavily in. They always needed money. I guess lots of us need money. He always need, he needed a lot of money. You know, his wife, his wife's father was one of the wealthiest landowners in Cincinnati. Owned, owned half of Cincinnati. But he always needed money. So uh, <clears throat> Chase was um, the two guys who got him into office, who lobbied to get him to be Secretary of Treasury because he was an ex-Democrat. So he wasn't really in, in big favor. Were the Cook brothers, Jay Cook the first famous banker. His brother Henry Cook was a big shot newspaper editor, like Cincinnati, whatever. So Henry Cook, was, uh, Jay Cook was a banker in Philadelphia, went to Philadelphia, became a banker, not too, you know, sort of a moderate sized banker, not, not too great shape. As soon as Lincoln, well they poured a lot of money into Chase's campaign, <clears throat> uh, campaign. It's estimated over the years, Jake, by 1864, in other words, by the end of the Lincoln administration, Jay Cook personally invested $100,000 in Chase's campaign. This is Chase's political life. It was boodles, either subsidies, bribery, or campaign. Now, $100,000 in the 1860s is enormous. It's like it's over a million now, or more than a million now, I think. Maybe more than maybe five million or something like that. Enormous amount of money poured in to Chase's campaign by Cook. So they have a very close connection between Chase and Cook. So Cook gets, Cook, Cook pours a lot of money into Chase's political stuff. He gets, he lobbies to get Chase named as Secretary of Treasury. And then what happens? The quid pro quo. Uh, after the greenbacks begin to fade out because they're depreciating, they're inflated, Cook, this, there's a, they, they, they put out a gimmick here, the National Banking Act. The gimmick is this. <clears throat> First of all, Cook gets from the Treasury Department the monopoly on the underwriting of all government bonds. Huge amount of government bonds now pouring out to pay for the war effort. Cook gets the monopoly. You know, in other words, Cook was the first investment banker. He sets up a, the house of J. Cook, Cook and Company <clears throat> in Philadelphia. J. Cook and Company. And he gets a contract from the Treasury that, he, that Cook has a monopoly and all floating in government bonds for the entire war. And as a matter of fact, it happened continuing on from then on until the 1870s. Except for one year, one or two years, Cook had a monopoly and all government bond issue, which is it's incredible. So this means that Cook gets a rake off and every, every government bond that's sold. <clears throat> that's the Chase-Cook connection. It's the way politics works. Cook pours $100,000 into Chase's political career. Chase becomes Secretary of Treasury and grants Cook monopoly on all government bonds. Now Cook is the first con man in finance. Well now we have the Republicans come in, they immediately create a system where State bank notes were outlawed. Only a new thing called national banks, which didn't exist before. There were no national banks. Every bank was chartered by the state government. Some state government. Now we have new things called national banks, chartered by the federal government, which have to be very large. In other words, a few large banks, mostly on Wall Street. A few New York, Philadelphia banks, half a dozen banks. They become the basis for the whole banking system. Bank, the banks now pyramid on top. Before that, we had individual banks. You have gold. Issue maybe three times as many banknotes. Now they can't do that because only a national bank can issue banknotes. The national banks, the state banks have to have accounts with the national bank to try to get banknotes. So you have to, you have to pyramid on top of the national bank, a few Wall Street banks, a few Philadelphia banks. These national banks pyramid on top of what? They pyramid on top of government bonds. Uh huh. In other words, they can create credit. They can expand credit and money. Uh, and of course, how many bo government bonds they buy. If they buy $1,000 of government bonds, they can they have $5,000 in bank credit, which the state banks then pyramid on top of. So in other words, the more government bonds they, they buy, the more they can pyramid inflationary credit on top of it. Who do they, who, okay, so the national banks like, who do they get the bonds from? They get it from only one person, Jay Cook. He's got a monopoly. So Cook lobbies for it, and then they have to go to Cook <laughs> to get their money so they can inflate on top of it, expand credit on top of it. That, that was a racket, it was a magnificent racket. Cook himself created a couple of national banks which he owned too. So <clears throat> we then have Cook emerging from the war as a, as a, as a multi-millionaire, as a top, uh, the top investment banker. <clears throat> and <clears throat> mostly financial, he didn't have much money before the war started. He, had, he was a sort of moderate banker. He begins to get a lot 
uh, from the Civil War. 